Well, good afternoon, all of you, and um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. I was worried yesterday you would not have been able to hear me from the back. I was working on a worsening voice, and I thought I was going to lose it all together. Very happy to say that I did not lose it all together, and um, that I'm here to uh, be able to and speaking loud enough, if, if I uh, start to fade, I will grab the microphone and work at a slightly lower uh, volume. And uh, so we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> uh, as, um, as Steve suggested, I want to talk about the commons. I need to get my computer to accept where I'm supposed to be at, which was back here. things that happen, tech problems that happen to old guys. None of you ever have tech problems, I'm sure. <clears throat> and um, despite the fact that Steve commented on all those things that I write about and think about and, and, and talk about, um, I actually have a side interest in uh, environmental policy and what I would call constitutional political economy of um, our thinking about the environment. I think this is a growing area of concern and it typically is approached largely from the question of policy. And one of the things I'm going to be uh, doing today is suggesting to you that thinking about policy by itself is an insufficient response to really any problem, but certainly um, environmental problems. Um, a quick poll. Uh, you've done a little bit of economics. I don't know if you've done this much economics. Um, what's your favorite environmental policy? There's two choices. Carbon tax or cap and trade? Carbon tax? Fans of carbon tax? Fans of cap and trade? Nobody wants to raise their hands. Okay. Notice how the debate goes though. Notice that um, in the, the economics literature, we really only have two options that people are willing to talk about. I mean, there's do, the do-nothing option, but most people aren't happy with that. And so the, the debate over, uh, over environmental policy on the large scale, the climate change issues and impact uh, at the large, at the systemic level, is really a debate between two policies. But you know what? There's some countries in the world that don't have adequate tax systems to tax people on the carbon tax. And there's some countries in the world that have a tough time, the United States is one of them, um, setting up a cap and trade system. Because the cap and trade system requires all kinds of institutional constructions and some of those, for example in the US, are things that don't fit our constitutional framework. The EU, for example, has a cap and trade system because they have a different kind of institutional framework. And so when you think about any policy, you have to think about the institutional context within which it operates. And that's the sort of the direction I'm taking you today in thinking about the tragedy of the commons, which is often thought of as a tragedy. And I want to suggest that when we think about it um, in, a, in a context where we consider the possibilities um, in a larger framework, the social framework, the political framework, the institutional framework of a society, it has often in human history been not the occasion of tragedy but the occasion of opportunity and uh, it can be for us as well. Um, the subtitle of my talk is Lessons from Constitutional Political Economy for Life in the Anthropocene. Have any of you heard of the, the term the Anthropocene? Again, only a couple. Okay. It literally means the age of human beings. It's being used in geologic and climate circles as a reference to the fact that they argue that um, from here forward, uh, the impact upon, uh, systemic impact of human beings on the environment will show up in the geologic record. So from here on, they, their argument is that future um, geologists will be able to mark our era as the era in which human beings were definitely um, around because our existence will show up in the geologic record as having impacted the earth in very specific ways. Um, I, if you want more about that, ask me at the end. <laughs> 
because I can say more about it at the end. <coughs> okay, um, so let, let's talk about what the commons is because um, people don't, sometimes don't know. So um, Professor Horwitz quite correctly identified the commons as the common pool resources. For a long time in economics, it wasn't called common pool resources, it was called common property resources, which um, I would argue, following Eleanor Ostrom's work, who you heard mention of before, um, confuses two issues. And so I want to get these two issues separated. One is the, the definition of common pool resource, and the second is the definition of the, of the um, governance regime, the property regime, under which common resources can be coordinated. Okay? Because frequently when we talk about, um, for example, private goods, public goods, common pool resources, okay, we immediately have connotations, so, so, you know, for example, private goods. Even without knowing what a private good is, you're probably thinking, well, that can be organized privately. Right? Somebody said something. Market? Yeah? Market. market. Private means market. Okay. And if you hear public, good, what comes to your mind? The public. That means government should organize it. Okay. That's not, neither of those is necessarily the case. It's something about the nature of the good that defines it as public or private, not the nature of the governance system. But we assume that, so public, and so when we say common property resource or common pool resource, we think immediately of the regime under which it would be governed. Anything that's common must be held in common. And if it's held in common, that's a bad thing, right? What happens, so how many of you live in an apartment off campus? Okay. Um, you're what, one week in the classes? Ten days in the classes? A couple weeks, yeah, okay. You, know, you guys started before Labor Day. Differences between Michigan and Indiana. Okay, 300 miles, 200 miles makes a difference. Um, it's straight up 69, my house. Um, so um, so you're, you're, you're into the school year for sure. Um, has anybody who lives in an apartment yet had a big fight over who's gonna clean the kitchen? You laughed. Yes? The kitchen a source of problems? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. How about the, um, the game room, TV room, common room, whatever you want to call it, living room? Had any troubles with that yet? No, it's totally like a mess, right? I mean, guys never have problems with it. They just leave it and leave it and leave it and leave it. Right? I actually knew a couple that every time they ran out of dishes, they threw them all away and went and bought a new set so that they wouldn't have to wash dishes or clean the kitchen. <clears throat> this sounds like a rational choice, right? So, um, the, the, so the, what I'm talking about about commons governance is relevant to your life in an apartment right? because you have common spaces and you may have walked into this situation without a clear set of understandings about how those common spaces would be governed. As I, I tell my students, you didn't construct a constitution for your life together <coughs> in your apartment before you entered into it. And you're, you may be paying the penalty for that now. Okay. But the, so the things about common pool resources you need to know is um, we say in economics that they're non-excludable. That is, they're resources where it's not possible to usually to exclude people from participation. Nice western scene here, keeping people out of the river, keep, keeping people from walking across the land uh, may well be uh, something that would be difficult. Okay. Um, as well, um, as well, um, the resource is, some, so common pool resources share something with um, private goods and they share something with public good. 
With public goods, they share the fact that you can't exclude people from, from participation. With private goods, they share the fact <laughs> that the stream of benefits that you receive from the commons can be identified separate from the stream of resources that another person gets from the common. So uh, the example I'll use is um, if you were standing on the riverbank here in Montana and you were looking at sunset, the sunset, which is a public good, you couldn't exclude the person standing next to you from seeing it, but you couldn't also um, prevent them from seeing it. That is, they're going to share the benefit of that sunset with you regardless of what you try to do, unless you, you know, like blind them or something, right? Um, and whereas with a, that's a, that's a public good. Um, with the common good, which is perhaps like the land that you're on or the river that's in front of you, the street, if you're fishing, for example, the stream of benefits that you get out of the common pool resource, say, for example, a fishery, the stream of benefits you get can be separated from the stream of benefits that somebody else has. Uh, for example, we can count the number of fish you take out of the common. We can count the number of fish that somebody else takes out of the common. We can count the number of your, of your cattle that are, on, that are grazing on a grazing land. We can count the number of cattle from somebody else who are grazing on the grazing land. So the commons shares things with the public good, and it shares things with private goods. And it's this fact that there are both features here which have traditionally made people consider the commons a difficult um, governance problem. Because we know how to manage <laughs> private goods, markets. We know how to manage public goods, government provision. Whether that's true or not is a different question. Okay? But commons problems combine elements of both. And this means uh, so this, this is why people have, have uh, thought of it as a tragedy. Garrett Hardin, in a famous essay in which he used grazing lands as the example, uh, you know, suggested that there were these problems and that everything was going to, you know, it was, well, in the end, Garrett Hardin and his wife committed suicide in order to decrease the future human population. Okay? Uh, because they believed so strongly that, the human, that human, hum, human existence on Earth was... Uh, fundamentally going to be a tragedy and so that they were not going to participate in it anymore. Um, but actually the fact that these two things are present mean that um, there are lots of possibilities okay, for how to govern the commons. They could be held in common, okay, which was the assumption of the Hardens. They could be held like a public good. Okay. A public good, you know, to put it in a different kind of parlance, a public good is simply a, uh, in this case, case, you could give the commons to the government who would hold it like a monopolist would hold it. And the government could hold it as, an, you know, saying the government is the owner of that commons. You could also put a corporation in charge. Many, many miles north of here, in western Canada, during the, the late, latter part of the 1800s, the beaver population was almost entirely wiped out um, because, two, because um, two companies were vying for market <laughs> power in, the, in, the, um, um, in, in Upper Canada, and really all of Western Canada, over the beaver population. And when, in 1871, they signed a deal which uh, took the two companies and merged them into one. The one company bore the name of the company that lost the debate, the Hudson's Bay Company. So the Hudson's Bay Company, even though it's a very famous company and it's actually the longest, uh, the, the longest standing corporation in human history, it's been in existence for 500 years. Okay? Uh, the Hudson's Bay Company actually effectively ceased to exist when the Northwest Company and the Hudson's Bay Company merged. The Northwest Company were the Scottish entrepreneurs from, uh, uh, from, um, from Montreal. Uh, there is a reason why McGill University is in Montreal. It has to do with the fur trade. Okay? And um, the Scottish entrepreneurs um, actually won the debate, but they wanted the marketing 
team figured out that Hudson's Bay Company was a better marketing tool. So they kept the Mar Hudson's Bay Company name. And, and what happened was when you had a monopolist running the fur trade, the beaver population came back up. And that grazing land for the beavers uh, was a commons, right? And so another possibility is that kind of public or monopolistic. It could be given to an individual as well, right? Same thing. Give it to a monopolist. Okay? There's a top of a mountain out in Montana that is owned by a friend of mine, Terry Anderson. He bought the top of a mountain, and he's going to leave it in perpetuity, and he's asked his kids to leave it in perpetuity sort of untouched. And so, you know, they've made decisions about how that property is going to be handled. And it, it's a kind of commons that will, or could be a part of a commons. And then, of course, there's open access where it's owned, but you give people access. So there's lots of different possibilities of governance. Okay. And um, this is why, th so this is where we've come into the, the question of it doesn't have to become tragic. It can provide a, a context in which human beings can sort out a governance problem where we can cooperate together to solve the commons problem to our mutual benefit. Okay. And that's the point of this slide. So whether it's tragic or whether it's an opportunity really ultimately depends upon the governance structure that's put in place and the, the people's interaction with that. And um, I'm going to just give away the punchline now. It turns out from the studies that Eleanor Ostrom does, and it turns out from the studies of constitutional history that Jim Buchanan of, the, of uh, George Mason and uh, these couple individuals back in 1789 called James Madison and Alexander Hamilton thought about um, when they constructed the defense of the American Constitution called in, in the papers called the Federalist Papers. Um, in, in all of these traditions, the argument is that no, that no one form of governance can actually successfully solve the commons problem, but that you need multiple places of authority. You need multiple participations in the govern governance problem, which is what Eleanor Ostrom called polycentricity. So polycentric governance means multiple centers of authority multiple centers of authority, okay. <clears throat> um, locality, right. um, the people who actually participate in the commons, the local government, um, a, a may, perhaps an association that's per a participant in the, in the process, the, um, the industry participation, take a fishery, the industry participation, um, et cetera. You can just go on. All of these have to be participants and have some kind of governance authority. And that governance, that polycentric governance authority allows um, solutions where one no form may actually um, work uh, in its entirety. Okay. <clears throat> you like my pictures? Okay. This is a real place. Okay. It's called the American Prairie Reserve. And it's a public-private cooperation in the creation of a commons. And I'm going to say something about it at the very end so you get a chance to hear it, to hear about it. So um, this slide was intended to actually do something I already said. So um, going from your favorite environmental policy to thinking about a constitutional political economy requires some steps. And so I, I gave you, you know, a couple environmental policies. I want to take you from there towards uh, thinking about constitutional political economy and the commons. And uh, the first of those steps is one that I actually said to you when I was talking about thinking about um, your favorite environmental policy already. So I'll, I'll just repeat it because repetition is one of the keys of good teaching. Okay. And uh, that is... Uh, and I call this the Horowitz question uh, with reference to your professor here um, because he posted this on Facebook on July 25th uh, this year. Um, he, 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 said, he said, all of you who are out there talking about your favorite policy about this and your favorite policy about that and this other thing, he says, you need to ask yourself a question. You need to ask yourself how well the institutions provide the people you're talking about 
with the knowledge and the incentives, right, that they require to know that they have made mistakes and guide them in how to correct their mistakes. So if you're not doing that, if you, if you aren't thinking about the institutional context and the information problems that those institutions solve for you and the incentive problems that those institutions solve for you, um, and, um, of course, he adds in this learning function, which I'll refer to in a minute. But if you're not thinking about that institutional context, then you're, th then you're not doing, you're not really able to address what policy will work. As I suggested, there are um, informational problems that some countries can't do. Okay? Um, one of my students once said, why does this country, he was referring to a sub-Saharan African country, why does this tr country not have very much income tax? And I said, because the government has no idea how to count its people or measure their income. And he said, the student said, well, isn't it like us, like your company pays you and they take it, you know, they, they know how much you're getting paid and they, they know how, what the tax rate is and they, and I said, where are the information systems to be able to do that? How do they know what the tax rate is? Because governments often, so how do you tax in, a, in, a, in an environment where you actually can't measure people and people's um, take or people's income, et cetera? How do, you, how do you tax in that environment? By the way, when did America start taxing people? Somebody should know this answer. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Yeah. We had trouble taxing people at that point in time. Why didn't we tax them before? Because it was only about that time that we gained the means of taxing people, that is, of being able to record people's information on more than a, a once every 10 years basis in the census. Prior to that, what did the U.S. depend upon for income, primarily? Taxing goods, right? tariffs and excise taxes. They taxed goods because, shoot, I can't pick it up. Well, my bottle of, where's my, my bottle of water over here? <coughs> I can count this. Think of this as a, um, I don't know, a box of tea for the Boston Tea Party. I can count this. I can put a sticker on this, a stamp. That's what the Boston Tea Party was about. The stamp taxes that were put on the box had to be paid. But I can't figure out how much I get paid. We you know we still have this problem today. We don't know what people are worth. We don't know how much wealth people have. We have a really hard, we have an easy time counting your income. We have a much harder time counting your wealth. Okay. What is your human capital worth? To make it really complicated, what's your social network worth? Okay. Shouldn't you be, you know, shouldn't we tax w people who have really rich social networks because they're like, they're wealthy? Okay. What? You like that? You're going to work on it? Oh, please don't. <laughs> How many? Fa oh, yeah, I only have like half the number of Facebook friends you have, if that. Yeah, I know. Uh, you know, Facebook ought to invent a new category for people like Horowitz. <clears throat> okay, but that, but that question about institutional context, that's a political economy question. And, and you know, that's a great question. That's the first step. Ask that political economy question. But then we have to ask the constitutional political economy question, at least one of the constitutional political economy. And that is, what are the rules by which we make those rules that institutions live under right, and that political entities and private entities live under. So it's not, so that we have to ask the question, what are the institutions? But then we have to ask the question, what are the rules that make the institutions? And how does that work? In the environmental context, this is an important lov level because uh, we often get frustrated about this because the rules um, are only at one level, the federal level. 
whereas many of the institutional constraints on the environment are at multiple levels, like local, state, corporate, nonprofit, and federal. And then, I've already mentioned polycentricity, so we can go by this fairly quickly, but here's Eleanor Ostrom and her work. The other person was Jim Buchanan, the Nobel Prize winner um, on who, whose work was specifically recognized on constitutional political economy. But Eleanor's work is also in constitutional political economy, although it's not often specifically called that. Um, I, it, I, the, I think the name of the research program is Institutional Design Anal institutional Analysis and Design, IAD, which is the same thing as constitutional political economy in my book. Okay. And so her contribution to this is the polycentricity argument, at least for this part of the thing. And if we start with an assumption that people are self-governing, which is a big assumption, but it could work for the U.S., okay. Okay. If we start with the assumption that the people who are actually engaged in the commons are actually participating in the governance of that commons, well, what support do they need from other sources of governance and higher levels of governance? Many of you know or may have heard that in the early 1980s, the government of Canada shut down the Newfoundland fishery and said there will be no fishing in the, um, off the Grand Banks um, for 25 years, period. What you don't know is, um, is that at that point in time, in the other maritime provinces, not Newfoundland, but the other maritime provinces, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Canadians had been at work for 10 years to construct a local solution to the problem of the cod, the inshore cod fishery problem. Everyone realized that the number of cod were dropping. They realized that there were offshore problems that were relevant to this. A lot of these big sea trawlers were coming in and draining up the, you know, sweeping up the, um, the cod. But they also realized that they were contributing to it, and they spent 10 years trying to put together a plan about how it was working, would work. They actually um, figured out a way to, um, people agreed to stop fishing. People agreed to move their, t their small towns away from where they were to move out of fishing, because if you're not going to fish for 25 years, you're going to have to go do something else. And so they figured out how to move people. They were in the process of starting to relocate entire communities, to relocate people to other places. Um, some of the companies were agreeing to shut down. They had a schedule for how they were going to shut down. And then the government came in. So, and then what happened, of course, was that a new federal government was elected in Canada. And on day two of that government, the, the minister of, uh, of the environment stepped up to a platform in the national capital, Ottawa, which, by the way, is an 11-hour is an drive from Halifax, Nova Scotia. I've driven it several times. Okay. And said, there will be no more fishing. Okay. So you had a polycentric government, a polycentric governance solution that had been work, people had been working on for 10 years. And then you had a federal government who didn't care about that process and just came in and wiped it out. And, um, and they could. But Buchanan asks an additional level of question as well that I want to add into this, and I would argue that Ostrom's work also connects to this theme as well. And that, that theme is, is, a, is a connection between the economic and political governance and our moral conception of our community and of our, our society. <clears throat> Buchanan, in a famous essay in 1985, Political Economy and Social Philosophy, which um, um, a friend of, of mine, Dick Wagner, at the George Mason, who was one of uh, Buchanan's longtime colleagues and students, um, 
says is one of is sort of the crucial article expressing Jim Buchanan's uh, point of view. Um, uh, says uh, says that in, in that essay, um, Buchanan asks us about whether the rules that we're using are rules that will allow you know people de democratically can create rules <coughs> that allow the coercive overriding of values that individuals have, right? And uh, Buchanan was concerned about that because. For him, one of the goals of a society was a, go a society in which while we don't agree on morality, we recognize each other as moral equivalents. So we don't have to agree on what we believe morally or believe our foundational morals, but it's essential to a liberal society that we treat each other as moral equivalents, that is, people who have moral viewpoints that are uh, relevant and viewpoints that are allowable into discussion on commons problems. Okay. <clears throat> and this moral equivalence okay, is, for Buchanan, the, the, uh, a core part of thinking about our governance of all society, not just commons. And I think it's extremely relevant to commons because there's an assumption, and frequently an assumption, that the only way we could reach um, a successful conclusion to the commons would be if we all agree about what we do about the commons, or we all agree about what the purpose of the commons is. Okay. And um, that's not necessarily the case. People have lots of different values. Can we treat others as moral equivalents, even if we disagree with them, about what morals we should be pursuing? And by the way, that's as relevant to a whole lot of conversations, not just the commons conversation. <clears throat> By the way, th this is, uh, those are yurts that they've built out on the uh, American Prairie Reserve. If you don't know what a yurt is, look it up. Um, it's kind of an interesting import from um, a different part of the world. So, <clears throat> I want to change now to um, thinking about some of these issues in the context of um, a couple uh, of aspects of environmental uh, problems that are worth thinking about. And the, the foundational one is the question of pristine nature. What's your image of pristine nature? Like, Like when you hear me say pristine nature, what, what's in your head? Somebody. The not, uh, what? The smoky, the smoky mountains. Okay. Um, are they smoky because? What? Ah, uh, because it, but they're not smoke. They're, that means forest fires. Yeah. So they're like foggy. They're like what? Foggy. Fog, but it's 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 haze mm -hmm. from all the trees. Yeah. Right? So it's a really, it's a, I mean, how many of you have been to the Great Smokies? Yeah. Beautiful place, right? Okay, other images of pristine nature? Or what, what comes to your mind when you hear pristine nature? Untouched. Untouched. That's a very important word. Untu Do you agree? Untouched? Okay. Yeah. Are there places, you said the Great Smokies, are there other places that Americans commonly identify with untouched nature? There's two, but I heard Alaska. That's a good third one. But yeah, What's, what was yours? I was going to say Crater Lake. What? Crater Lake. Crater Lake, okay. Yeah. Yellowstone. Yellowstone. The, two, the two biggest national park attendances in America are Yellowstone and Yosemite. And Yosemite is often also viewed as an untouched nature. So, I, so l let me, since I just mentioned that, I'm going to skip way ahead. And, oops, went too far. Shoot. 
Okay, so there's the Yosemite Valley in two different pictures that are 100 years apart. The first picture is one of the first pictures we, have ever, we ever have had of Yosemite Valley taken. Um, it's probably in the 1870s, maybe a late 1860s. Okay. The one on the right, the one in color, okay, actually Kodachrome if you care, um, dates probably from the 70s or early 80s. I couldn't find an exact date for it, but it, I specifically d chose one that's about 100 years different. What do you notice that's different about these two pictures? What? <laughs> Color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay, what else do you notice? Uh, you know, what did people do before we had color cameras? Like, did they saw the, uh, everything was black and white? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a whole, aren't there? There's a whole lot more trees over here, right? And actually, if you took it to today, how many of you, did anybody go to Yosemite this summer? <coughs> anybody been to Yosemite recently? I haven't either, so. But, but apparently, the trees are even bigger. In fact, they're so big that from the valley, it's almost impossible to see El Capitan. <coughs> it's hard. You don't get a good view. You have to figure out a way to get up <coughs> to see the waterfall. The, that's the lower waterfall. And, or, El, uh, or El Capitan. Okay. But over here, look, you, I mean, you would have been able to see it from anywhere. Right? But doesn't untouched, like pristine, untouched, doesn't that look more like this than like that? And let me tell you, this is touched. This is untouched because it's a national park. This is touched. You said forest fire? Yeah, for sure. Okay. But why were there forest fires? It's not even for, it, these are designed forest fires. Who was setting forest fires before Europeans arrived at Yosemite Valley. Native Americans. Native Americans. The Native Americans who lived in Yosemite Valley regularly set fires and burned parts of the valley, indeed all of the valley. Why? Look at that picture a little more carefully. What kind of trees are there? Well, first of all, what kind of trees are here? Uh, right. All evergreens or mostly. There's actually, right here, there's a deciduous tree. Okay. So somewhere, there's a, you know, there's a few deciduous trees, but mostly it's all evergreen. So over here, there's a few evergreens, but actually most of what you see in the black and white picture is um, that that's, um, that's flora is um, deciduous trees and ground growth, okay. like bushes and, and low stuff. Why would you want to encourage that? Why, why wouldn't you want this beautiful valley? Why would you want this? Somebody's got to be able to figure this out. Yes. Uh, animals can't eat pine needles. Thank you. Animals don't survive on pine needles. And furthermore, pine needles, you ever, you know, if you've ever had a pine tree in your yard, right, pine trees kill everything underneath it. Pine needles actually have a poison in it that kills any other that plants that grow underneath it. So if you have a lot of pine trees, you don't have uh, flora underneath the pine trees. And why would you want low-lying bushes and low trees? What? You want the grazing animals. You want grazing animals, but you also want berries right? and fruit that grows on those things. It doesn't grow on the evergreens, it grows on the other, the, the low-lying bushes. So, first of all, you get um, better variety of plant life that will enrich your diet. And secondly, you get a greater variety of animal life that also enriches your diet and allows for other things to happen. Human beings were burning y y y Yosemite long before Europeans ever knew about North America. So what the heck is pristine nature 
What is the baseline we're going to use if it's not pristine nature? If it's not, if every image we have of nature going back is actually nature that was touched, that is nature that human beings adapted to their own purpose, then what is the baseline? Is the baseline, like the Paris Accord says, pre-industrial time? <coughs> Who's pre-industrial? The Paris Accord means North America and Europe. We're still in the pre-industrial sub-Saharan Africa era. So whose pre-industrial time zone counts? Time frame counts. What, what, what are we going to do? And what institutions are we going to use? Question, so even these basic questions that we all think we know the answer to, like our goal should be to, to make sure that you know, we go back to the period where we were pre-industrial and we had sort of a pristine nature. Maybe not. <clears throat> we also have to recognize this institutional problem. I, I have only time to just barely touch on this, but um, <coughs> the institutional framework we operate on is a very bad mismatch of institutions and policy. If you look at federal um, national park policy and federal national uh, land policies, you, it's a real mishmash. And it's very difficult because Congress makes the policies. But the people who have to live under it are the people who live on or near the parks and the lands. How much of Montana is federal land? 60 plus percent. Imagine if 60% of Indiana was federal land and ruled by Congress and not ordinary, pe you know, the people of Indiana. Okay. So here is the American Prairie Reserve. <coughs> the American Prairie Reserve is located in Montana and it's a, um, it, a public-private cooperative venture involving federal land and private lands that will ultimately, the goal is ultimately to create three million acres of land. That's, by the way, 50% bigger than Yellowstone. Okay. And by the way, Yellowstone's there. Okay. And there's the area uh, where the um, American Prairie Reserve will be. And the, so they, they but, but their expanse is not, it's not just a private entity and a public entity working together. It's many private entities because what the American Prairie Reserve does is work with private farmers who have lands and are willing to work with the Prairie Reserve right, not only on land management but also on things like um, animal um, management. So, um, for example, um, you know about the wolf problem in Yellowstone. Well, you, wolves are migrating across, um, across Montana, and you can imagine farmers being very concerned about wolves, you know, coming onto their cattle lands. Right? Um, but um, the American Prairie Reserve actually um, is working with farmers around wolf management issues. And by the way, grizzly bears are on the horizon. Uh, cougars are already present as well. And, yeah, and, um, and, so there, and one of the outcomes of that is that farmers who work with them on wildlife management end up being able to sell their beef through a private firm called Wild Sky who sells hamburger meat to high-end restaurants all over the United States right, as really good beef. Right. Oh, would, don't you want grass-fed natural beef? Right. Uh, this is grass-fed natural beef. Right. And um, they get really good prices for it at good restaurants. Without knowing it, you may have eaten beef from Wild Sky. 
that revenue then goes back into the, farm, the, the rancher's hands and the American Prairie Reserve gets a portion of the profits as well. They also work with, this is a, um, a, a very old homestead that was recently donated to the American Prairie Reserve. It's a private ho uh, holder of land that, and they're remaking the, 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 the homestead, um, sort of fixing up some of the things that will become part of the process of being able to use it for people visiting or uh, people who want to stay on the land. And there's also educational, an, uh, an educational nonprofit that works with them called Landmark. So notice the mix. You have public land, you have private land, you have pri uh, private en uh, commercial entities, uh, you have nonprofits, you have the ownership of land, and you have landholders who are part of the process. Um, so that means that you also have um, uh, state government issues involved. All of these are involved, but notice that the, the context of the management of this grassland, which is a commons that's shared, is... Um, is, is all under the coordination of a nonprofit organization that is doing all that coordination and, and dealing with all those different levels of governance and coordinating them together to a greater purpose, which is the creation of a three million acre right, um, public land, publicly accessible land. I won't talk now about expertise, but I'll read Eleanor Ostrom. There's no reason to believe that bureaucrats and politicians, no matter how well-meaning, mean, are better at solving problems than the people on the spot who have the strongest incentive to get the solution right. Okay? And that's what the American Prairie Reserve is working towards, and that notion of polycentricity and focusing it from the bottom up instead of assuming that it should be top down. We'll let the local people converse. No, build it from the bottom up, not the top down. Questions? <laughs> Questions? None? Yes? So what assurance, or what ways are there of assuring that if you work from the bottom up, that's uh, it's a great question because you might not. You 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 might not. It, it you might get your door, your um your apartment's TV room three months from now. Mold growing under the carpet. Beer. Oh, did I say beer? Um. Uh, Soda cups all over the place, pop <laughs> bottles all over the place, dishes in the sink, you know, with mustard and ketchup and pizza remains on them. Um, but you might get that. You might also get another outcome. You might also get a really good outcome or a, a, an okay outcome, maybe, that's different than what the government wanted. You might get an outcome that's not what the people who wanted to save this land or save this fishery or save this grazing land or something. It might be different than what they wanted it to happen. People are like, oh, and I'll use my state because I know it better than Indiana. You know, we need to save this piece of property so we should make it a state park. And it's literally a half acre, literally half acre on this particular spot that somebody, some private person had developed maybe a roadside stand that was right beside a stream and they're like, oh, we should keep this, so let's give it to the government to keep. It's like, well, what if we just said, are there any other people who'd like to keep this up? And if they're not, then let it be sold. Because really, the state government's involvement in it is doing a favor for some representative. The representative's doing a favor for some um, voter who wants to um, keep, have somebody keep this land exactly as their grandfather made it. And, like, why don't, why don't we just say, 
things are going to go to the uses that people want to make of them. And if people want to create commons and preserve commons and make them work really well, they'll invest themselves in it. And not assume that the only way it's going to be preserved is if we hand it over to a top-down governance structure. Of course, what the state of Michigan has done is said, we can't afford all this stuff. And since it was given to the government, they've turned around and sold it to private people. They sold it at the highest market price. Some of them were pretty pristine lands that, I use that word, um, that pristine, uh, lands that would, went for a pretty penny, probably to a large you know, donor to the whatever party is in power. Is that the best use for that? Maybe, you know, may, you know economists might say, well, it you know, goes to the highest use. But we might be, have been able to keep it as a commons without all that process. Does that sort of answer your question? Yes, back. So how is, uh, how is this prairie organization overcoming the free rider problem? Yeah, that's a great question. How, because the free rider problem is a, a public goods problem, but obviously it's relevant to commons as well. Uh, partly, you know, isolation helps. <laughs> There's not a whole lot of people who are ready to flock during the months of February and March to uh, the, you know, the eastern part of Montana. Okay. I have a good friend who once farmed, listen to this carefully, once farmed 400 square miles, P.J. Hill. His farm was 400 square miles in eastern Montana. Okay. After one winter, he went to the Montana State University and said, could I come teach during the wintertime? <laughs> right. Bozeman's a whole lot more interesting, and Bozeman's not all that interesting. Bozeman's a whole lot more interesting than um, you know, sitting out on 400 square miles of cattle and snow. Right. So yeah, but, but th that helps. But you have, you, you're right, but um, that's a problem that can be addressed. That's a problem that we turn to the commons, the, the people who are involved in the governance of the commons to ask. And th do they care about it? We have lots of free rider situations that, are, that aren't a problem. And, um, and, and we, can figure out, you know, we can figure out how we're going to deal with it. So my answer is I, there isn't a, a, a single answer. Different commons will take different approaches. The governance structures will figure it out. The biggest commons problems, you know, one of the biggest commons problems that Americans are addressing today is, right, is who has access to the commons that is the American life. And we've had a number of recent activities and rulings that are shrinking that number. That's a commons. We have to decide what we're going to do. I'm not saying I agree with the decisions made. I'm simply saying we have to decide what to do. Somebody else had a question. Right. Uh, what is the role for that? You talk about the people. Can you have more of a voice? Yeah. Is that just the data collectors, like researchers? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but um, when we say the people, oh, we often mean two different things. In America and other democratic societies, when we say the people, we mean like through voting, right? And uh, people are just anonymous. And when I mean the people, I mean like the actual individuals who are involved in this commons, are involved in the organizations that connected to that commons, the local people. Because they're the ones, so the problem is decisions are made about the, the, the commons that affect them by people who are removed from their actual experience like your landlords, make rules about your commons without understanding your situation. Right? Right? So just like that. Okay. Uh, sorry. Rental suites is like a great example of the commons because it has all the attributes of common tragedy and opportunity. <laughs> and I do, I, uh, like, uh, opportunity as well. Right? But you know, and you also have the possibility of, you know, the totalitarian government that is your landlord, you know, making the ruling. So, but, so yes, you collect data as well. 
But you collect data about use, you collect data about land, you, you collect data about the things that matter to the governance of that commons, not just to some external source. And one of the things that Eleanor Ostrom's work has shown is that a lot of times government data collection is unhelpful for commons management because the land that's included in the commons is simply put into a bigger group. And so you don't get enough information about what's happening here because you're measuring it, you know, like by the county or by the, you know. Yeah. 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 Yes. Can you give us an example of where a commons was actually governed by the people that were using it and then a uh, higher agency came in and changed things and there was a dramatic change? Well, I guess I was trying to do that with the Canadian example of the fishery where they were trying to fix the problem of the commons and then a unilateral decision from the, from the higher ministry would come in. Can you think of another? Fishery, I mean, fisheries ones are just all over the place because they're, it's a big topic right now is fisheries management. And um, um, you've heard of Brexit and the, U, the, you know, the UK probably leaving... Um, the EU, I would say certainly leaving the EU, and um, the EU's fisheries policy uh, is attributable, um, is, um, in, uh, it is right now supersedes UK law. And one of the reasons why so many people in Scotland especially voted against, or voted for Brexit is because the Scottish fisheries feel particularly disadvantaged by EU policy. So, for example, fishing, fishing in the, um, um, in the channel, the English channel, the land, the, the water between France and England, um, um, French fisher, uh, the fishing, the French fishing fleet on a daily basis are allowed to take five times what the English fleet is allowed to take. Why is that? The French fishing fleet has a union which is really strong with the French government and said to the French government, you have to fight for us at the EU. And the, the English and Scottish fishing fleet, uh, it has a union, but it's a different kind of union and a much less powerful union. And, um, and uh, in the debates, the, the ultimatums from the French fishing fleet held. And so the French, and, and it, 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 just by itself, the amount the French fish, is an overfishing of the English Channel. And the, and the English have this little small amount. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just coming up with examples. And it also matters in that case how you count. So they said, what we're going to count is the fish that we land. That is, we're going to count the fish that are brought back to port and, and brought to the market. Not how much we caught out in the ocean, but how much we landed at the, de at the, at the dock. And so the English fleet pulls up a, a, a net full of fish, and if, the, if, the fish, if there are fish in that net that they cannot take with them, they throw them back. But the fish are already dead. They've been killed by the, fish, by the nets. So you're throwing back into the ocean, right, dead fish that you could take to, and sell, but you're not allowed to because it will violate the count, and you're tossing them back into the ocean because you have to do this because if you're caught overfishing, overlanding is really what you're caught for, then it's, you know, then it's a big offense. They've still killed the fish. Why can't they land them? So these kind of issues are ones where the sort of and, you know, sort of the top-down governance issue doesn't always, and, and I'm not against all top-down governance. In fact, Adam Smith, you know, made a really good point in terms of thinking about top-down governance in terms of schools. He said the goal of the top-down governance is to enable lower levels to provide education. It's not to provide the education or control the education themselves, but to enable lower levels to do it. And that's the kind of argument that you might want to think as, as an Ostrom kind of argument and a Buchanan kind of argument. The higher the level, the more general the governance.
So you want to set it up so that lower levels can govern. Instead of usurping their authority, what's the appropriate kind of control at this level? What's the appropriate kind of control down here? Enable lower levels to govern. Enable decisions to be made closer to the problem rather than farther away. It's not that no governance is appropriate. It's what kind of governance is appropriate. Did you have a question for me? No. Yes? So the American Credit Reserve yeah. is kind of a cooperation between public and private uh, entities. What types of like, specific organizations or companies make Okay, so, so the American Prairie Reserve specifically is a cooperation uh, between, so the public's cooperation is that it's public land. There, there's this big chunk of public land. There's two big uh, national or federal lands that are attached along that river, along, I think this is the Missouri, but I might be wrong, but along that river. Okay. So that green, it, there's a National Wildlife Refuge, and then this over here is, an, is another part of, I don't think it's the National Wildlife Refuge, but another part. So that's under federal jurisdiction. Okay. And then um, the stuff that they're adding, which uh, they, uh, you don't see where they're adding, but they're, they've been adding all along this corridor okay, is a combination of land that the reserve is buying plus farmers who are agreeing to cooperate with them, who are holding on to the land. So there's private land, often ranches, so they're homes and for-profit organizations. You have the reserve's own purchases, so that's non-profit ownership of land. Um, you also have cooperation, um, so you have different degrees of cooperation with farmers. Some farmers are willing to have their land become, in a sense, part of the reserve <coughs> in the future. So they're writing agreements where once they die, the land will roll into the, the, the reserve's properties. Others are simply willing to contract for specific r relationships, like our cattle will agree to certain wildlife um, conservation principles, and then we'll be able to sell uh, part of our beef to Wild Sky. And we can, we can add to this, because they do all, you saw all those people like live, staying in those yurts, and you saw people walking. So there's all kinds of sort of tourist kind of stuff that uses that land, and there has to be agreements around that and revenue generated by that. Um, and, you know, we can go on. So basically the reserve is creating all different kinds of ways that people could interact with this, with this common good. What seems to me to be key to there, Ross, is that there's a set of rules that they've all agreed upon right. to how to engage in those multiple different ways right. of interacting with it. And that's, right. that's the fundamental, that's your point earlier about if right. we agree on the rules, we don't need to agree on the particulars of morality. Or, or right, exactly. So I, I don't have to be you know, really concerned about what your purposes are if we have a set of rules that guide, that, that set parameters around what can happen. So on a, just in a, like a, a very basic question, what separates this reserve from like Yellowstone? Yeah, is, right. Is the cooperation of the people who are there with the already set Well, and, and, the, and the ownership, because Yellowstone has a single owner. Being the government. Being the government. And furthermore, its purposes are determined by a single entity, that's the U.S. Congress. And then they dictate to the National Forest Service what, and the National Forest Service says, as they do every year, you don't give us enough money to do that, so we're going to keep people out. Or we're going to charge, and then they say, no, 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 you can't charge more money. Right? Well, here they, you can create all kinds of charges that are appropriate to the activity being engaged in, not in Yellowstone. So what do you get in Yellowstone? Any of you been to Yellowstone? I haven't been. I've been about 10 feet from the northern door, but haven't actually been in. You know, but what my understanding is, you know, most of your experience in Yellowstone is waiting in long lines. I, I don't know the full story. I'd have to go ask. By the way, I have not yet been to the American Prairie Reserve. I have a good friend who works there. 
She used to work in Bozeman at the uh, Property and Environment Research Center, PERC. And um, she, I met her there, and we were, were good friends. And, um, and now, now she's working for um, the American Prairie Reserve. And so one of my goals is to go to Montana and get a big, long tour. Okay. Um, so find out more. So yes, yeah, question in the I'll back. That's a good question. Right. Yeah, Vince does, for sure. By the way, so does Frank Knight. For Frank Knight, democracy is government by discussion, not just free and fair elections. Cecil knows all about this. We spent a weekend last weekend talking about Frank Knight. Um, and um, so, yeah, deliberation is really important. And um, I, I mean, also, innovation. So, so one of the things that this kind of structure allows that the National Forest Service structure doesn't allow is all kinds of innovative activity to try to figure out how to use the commons, right? So the American Prairie Reserve people are constantly having people come to them and say, hey, this is a great idea. What if I did the following on your land? If I, if I started an education program? What if I did this? So you get all kinds of innovation happening here because there's lots of different avenues for engagement with their group, right? Um, so, but, um, so the, it's a good question, like, what is the catalyzing change? Is it a change in a set, certain set of costs? Is it a change in uh, um, sort of gover the government's willingness to engage different kinds of rule sets? I, I actually think it's primarily an entrepreneurial change of a person saying, I have a vision for a public-private uh, relationship to create a reserve that's huge, and there's a lot of interest in, in you know, protecting natural resources. So it, could I leverage that and find ways to leverage that to create a, a, um, a reserve that isn't public? We never go to the government and ask them to take it over. We make it a public-private partnership from the start. I, I suspect that that's the sort of the catalyzing thing is the vision of we could do this. Now let's figure out where. So please join me in thanking Ross.